the first one will be Shima Kartalic. She's a, doctor, a doctoral candidate. She's doing her PhD with, uh, with us here at the Medea Chart Project. Um, she has many, many interests and uh, almost every interest is very interesting. So uh, with us today, she will be talking uh, about geographical knowledge at sea in pre-Portland periods. So good luck, Shima. Go ahead. All right. So thank you, everybody. I'm very excited to present to you today and share some sources that I think are really interesting. I'm going to be overlapping a little bit with some of the other speakers, but I hope our overlaps will complement each other well. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. From the late 13th to early 14th century come to us a few precious examples of the early period of Italian nautical cartography. While their differences from each other and from later charts have been stressed, they already show signs of established visual conventions and potential indications of the use of pattern charts for their drafting. The charts that survive must not have been the first. Although early in the history of surviving nautical charts, they're in a way the end of a so-called formative period. Today, I would like to touch on some of the social and pragmatic aspects of navigation in this formative period, especially as relates to the accumulation of nautical expertise, focusing on the 12th to 13th centuries and the leading Italian maritime states, because it is from these states that the first charts were produced. In so doing, I will attempt to track the logistical conditions that allowed the compilation of geographical knowledge. I will also, as I said before, take the opportunity throughout to share some interesting primary and secondary sources that aren't talked about so much in our community, but that I think others might enjoy. And anyone who knows me and my background will know that this talk is a bit outside of my comfort zone and area of expertise, but my hope is that nonetheless, something in here can be of interest. I'm going to be examining this topic at three levels. First of all, the way an individual mariner could build their mental map through experience on merchant ships. Then the collective knowledge embodied on a ship, taking the ship as a unit of knowledge. And finally, the means by which information could be recorded while at sea. As you might have noticed, these are big topics. So my goal is not to give a complete account, but to add some texture to the world of the formative period and if possible, fill in a couple of gaps in the story of how navigation worked in practice in this important moment. So we'll start with the level of the mariner. When we look at a chart, we see an artifact that reflects knowledge and needs of sailors as Tony, Joaquin and so many others have pointed out. We are presented with local details, probably related to short-term journeys along coasts, fitted together in a spatial and proportional arrangement informed by pelagic and long distance sailing. But this kind of experience at sea did not come about for the sake necessarily of adventure or certainly not for fun. People went to sea for a reason. Among these were of course, fishing, piracy, and the best studied cases, war, pilgrimage, and trade. Although wars often mobilize large numbers of ships to sail short or long distances, trade formed a more constant impetus to sailing and in the medieval period, traders' ships were often co-opted for military efforts or to carry pilgrim traffic. Thus, it is on the experiences of merchants and traders that this talk will focus. The places to which a merchant ship could sail and in so doing collect knowledge through experience was obviously subject to constraints due to changing political situations. Ibn Joubert, an Andalusi geographer, poet, and in the late 12th century, pilgrim, gives us a clue about how these vicissitudes felt on the ground. On a stopover in Trapani, Joubert relates that an order from the King of Sicily had arrived, preventing all ships from leaving the shores because the King was preparing a fleet and did not want any vessels to depart before his fleet did. Even tighter control of traffic could be exercised and was exercised in the establishment of control fleets such as the Venetian galleys of the 13th century Adriatic. Although there are ample examples of official or papal decrees being flouted by merchants, as in the illicit trade of timber to Egypt throughout the 13th century, nonetheless, political concerns did have real world implications. 
While trade, while politics on one hand could disrupt movement, it could also play a part in stimulating trade and establishing new routes, and not merely by the capture of territories or establishment of outright colonies. A less dramatic way of opening routes and in turn expanding and solidifying knowledge of the sea can be examined in the context of the fondaco, to use the Italian term, or funduc, this is the original Arab uh, designation. This institution and its analogs are given a sweeping treatment in Olivia Remy Constable's Housing the Stranger, pictured at right. After all, we must realize that a mariner could not simply arrive at a port and dump their merchandise. These things took time, and having a semi-permanent base was a major desideratum among trading states. In the Islamic world, the funduk served as a warehouse for Muslim merchants and a meeting place to do business. But as Italian traders, starting with the Amalfitans in the late 10th century, sought to actively participate in North African commerce, the institution was adapted for use, of, for the use of these Christian foreigners, called Rum, in several Muslim and Jewish sources. One of these sources on pre-12th century trade, which I want to pause just to give a shout out to, is the Cairo Geniza. Uh, <clears throat> This is a unique source for late medieval shipping uh, prior to the establishment of Genoese cartularies and comprises some 400,000 documents covering trade and shipping from the 10th to 13th centuries in North African and Eastern Mediterranean uh, territories. Their survival came about for an interesting religious reason. The users of the warehouse, mostly Arabic speaking Jews, considered it improper to destroy texts written in Hebrew letters since Hebrew was the language of God. It was on the basis of the Geniza that Shlomo Dov Goitin penned his multi-volume opus, A Mediterranean Society, a must read for any historians interested in the formative period. Letters kept in the Geniza from the 11th century note that already at that time, pepper prices in Tunisia were strongly impacted by fluctuations in demand from the room. And amusingly, that the Europeans in Ascalon were all too eager to buy up Egyptian flax of so, so such low quality that none of the Muslim traders would touch it. Thus, even before we get information on the establishment of merchant bases, we can grasp the long-standing maritime links existing across the Mediterranean and across religious lines. Returning to the Fondaco and its equivalents, a number of treaties stipulate the provision of such a facility as a diplomatic bargaining chip, as in the crucible of 991, granting the Venetians a domo in Constantinople, and a treaty between Pisa and the Fatimids signed in 1154, giving them use of a funduk in both Cairo and Alexandria. In the Islamic world, these Christian fondacos typically consisted of lodgings, storage, a church, weekly access to a bath, and an oven for making bread. Associated with the Fondaco were staff whose length of service varied according to treaties by which the Fondaco was founded. This institution, with some moderation, mo modifications depending on where they were located and when, endured for centuries, as we can see in these late surviving uh, facilities. While on the one hand, the individual rallying of these proto-nation states like Pisa, Genoa, Amalfi to acquire their own fondaco seems to suggest an insularity and strong rivalry. More recent scholarship has noted a certain porousness of national boundaries. 13th century notarial records show collaboration and contracts between merchants from different Christian states in Tunis with the notaries going from fondaco to fondaco to facilitate business. Going back earlier, Enrico Salvatore, in her excellent account of the 12th century Pisan corsair Trapelichinus, has interpreted the terms of several treaties as trying to root out the potential problems caused by mixed crews with Genoese, Pisans, and what have you all on one ship. Uh, the problem here obviously could be that you might be carrying an enemy to a place that has bad diplomatic relations. Evidence for this practice seems to have increased in the 13th centuries with sailors, to use David Abulafia's term, sailing under a flag of convenience. Indeed, when the proto Italian proto-states began to draft nautical laws to be discussed shortly, it was often stipulated that should a sailor fa desert, fall ill, or die, 
the ship had to replace this crew member at the nearest port of call. We have to imagine that finding an able pair of hands trumped maintaining political homogeneity in the crisis, and that the promise of paid work could entice a person to aid the ship of a supposed rival. To sum up then, the individual mariner could learn the Mediterranean space through the experience of travel, in part organized according to where established bases like the Fundaco were located, or through oral transmission brought about by contact with sailors of different national origins and in all likelihood, different areas of expertise. This reference to mixed crews brings us on to our next theme, the ship as a melting pot of nautical knowledge. The formative period of the nautical chart overlaps with the so-called commercial revolution, marked by increasing volume and sophistication of trade and financial instruments, as well as shifts in how the ship functioned as a cognitive unit and place where knowledge, like that expressed on the chart, could be pooled. These changes are highly evident in the evolving, um, in the evolution of nautical legal codes. While the Consulate of the Sea and the Black Book of the Admiralty are well-known later sources, a variety of nautical laws developed in precisely the formative period of the nautical chart, often concomitant with the rise of these maritime states. Among the important comparative co contributions, um, I've shown here the early and important edition of Pardesu, Ashburner's 1909 edition of the Rhodian Sea Law, which includes a comparison with um, classical law and some of the medieval Italian laws, and more recent work on Islamic jurisprudence vis-a-vis -vis the Byzantine codes. While it could be uh, easy to write off the contents of these laws and the behaviors they stipulate as being optimistic and prescriptive, but in no way connected with reality, several factors suggest their intimate connection to actual navigational practice. As Ashburner notes, the first is the fact that many of these codes show extremely active revision over the centuries. The earliest copy of the Usus Constitutum of Pisa, for example, has not only cross-outs, fill-ins, uh, marginal additions, but also, as you can see on this detail, literally been palimpsested in order to contain the latest version of the code. Another reason why uh, we can think that these laws actually have some bearing on actual practice is that the nature of the problems they solve are extremely pragmatic. And finally, there's a frequent formulation, secundum consuetudinem and secundum usu, according to tradition, according to practice, that is invoked so frequently in the codes, particularly in the Amalfitan and Venetian uh, traditions. So we may understand these laws therefore, as at once codifying common practice and suggesting potential solutions. They concern everyday problems for mariners. For example, the payment due to sailors if they have to winter abroad unexpectedly, interdictions against cooking over a flame on board, fire being a major problem for timber ships, what was owed to a mariner if he got sick and had to go ashore mid-voyage, etc. Although sometimes very dry, the laws are peppered with lively details. For example, the rules of Oleron, outside the scope, but I just want to mention this because it's funny, uh, stipulates that a shipmaster can punish a sailor by slapping them, but only once. After that, the sailor is at uh, liberty to defend themselves. Uh, even more colorful is uh, the information in the Catalan Consulate of the Sea of the 14th century, which regulates who is responsible if goods are damaged by rats. The answer is, the shipmaster is wholly responsible if he does not have a cat on board. If his cat dies, he is obliged at the next port of call to secure a replacement cat. So if you can imagine this kind of comic stopover invoked by this dry legal stipulation, this is where it starts to get a little bit funny reading these sources. But coming back to the main point, uh, although subject to some variation, if we focus specifically on laws of the 12th to 13th century, produced in Italy, we see a lot of overlap and some direct borrowing. And a review of the contents of these laws reveals their scope, merchant shipping, which is what we're talking about in general. The importance of these laws for us is how they deal with navigational decision-making on board and how they suggest stability or instability of crews and therefore knowledge. 
in these laws, far from the hyper-specialized division of labor and hierarchic uh, structure to be seen in later maritime con context, we often observe collective decision-making between stakeholders on ships, even when it comes to navigational choices. The Venetian Statute of Zeno and the Statute, Zeno and the Statute of Ancona, for example, both suggest that decisions be made by a group of five. The main owner of the ship, the Nauclarius, a kind of captain slash ship manager, and three elected merchants. And indeed, the passengers and the merchants in several codes, including the Pisanusus, are allowed to overrule the Nauclarius and insist on a course or a stopover. Our friend that we just talked about, Ibn Joubert, bore witness to both kinds of organization, both overt leadership by a charismatic expert and committee decisions. On the one hand, Joubert praised the navigational expertise of one of the captains on his ship. So we can infer that one figure was collectively understood to be the main decision maker. Uh-oh, I have a chat, sorry. Am I running out of time? Five minutes. Oh, I'm doing perfect, Bruno, thank you. Um, then again, on the leg of Joubert's journey in the Western Mediterranean, he refers to the leading room in the plural, going ashore to talk to the Lord of St. Mark Island. Then on the approach to Sicily, he relates the opinion of Rumi sea captains, again, plural. Who were these leaders, if not people responsible for decision-making on board, people who knew the sea? Also in the formative period, up, um, changes took place to the way merchant ships were staffed. These two are reflected in the maritime legal codes and were studied in a fascinating paper written, I think, around 1960 by Richard Jackson at Yale. The shift appears to be from what Jackson terms profit sailing, akin to the Corsair model of splitting up proceeds, to wage sailing, in which a mariner was hired by a ship's owner or owners for a trip or a sailing season. In a recent comparative study of medieval nautical legal codes, Albrecht Cords reaches similar conclusions. Wage sailing, increased specialization, and decreased bonds on board went hand in hand. And this process unfolded in the 13th century, just around the time that the chart is entering the scene. With the loss of the almost familiar structure of the crew, the collective mental map of the sea embodied on a ship was increasingly in flux. For the first time, desertion became a serious issue. In such a context, the chart would have helped stabilize geographical knowledge just when the, that stability was needed most. So far, this talk has been concerned with the ways geographical knowledge could be in, uh, acquired through firsthand experience or through communication. But in making a chart requires multiple competencies. And one of the more co problematic competencies is literacy, which is often assumed to have been absent among the crew of a ship. Likewise, there's a problem of recording geographical information while at sea, which would be difficult considering uh, you are on a moving ship, it is wet, and generally one prefers to work at a desk with materials like parchment and a quill. This would seem to imply that knowledge of the Mediterranean could only be accumulated by memory and transmitted ashore with the assistance of a scribe or a notary for the writing part. I'd like to close this talk with a brief comment on these issues. First, about literacy on board. A unique feature of medieval Mediterranean nautical codes, including the statutes of Tiepolo, Zeno, Zara, Tortosa, Barcelona, Ragusa, Trani, Amalfi, and the Breve Curia Maris of Pisa, is the obligation that ships travel with a scribe, sometimes two for a larger ship. The notes taken by this scribe, once ashore, had the power of legal instruments. To the extent that ships did adopt this practice, and there is reasons to think it would be useful for them, we have to imagine highly literate practitioners regularly traveling on the major trade routes, taking notes, and perhaps even making sketches and taking part in navigational uh, discussions. Nor would they need, due to a reliance on parchment and quill pens and fussy, messy instruments, to have waited until they were on shore to write. The wax tablet of antiquity was in common use throughout the Middle Ages. Indeed, Bernard Bischoff remarks that daily life cannot be imagined without them. As we can see in this detail, with a fine tip stylus, the wax could receive lettering, uh, very small lettering and hold a lot of information. 
Though often used among school children, it was not a primitive support for writing and drawing. It may have been the preferred medium for note-taking or sketching on board. Uh, we do not need to assume simply because parchment was costly and paper may be prone to waterlogging that no means of recording information while at sea existed. So, <clears throat> Oh, which I want to use that one? No, not, not yet, sorry. <laughs> I'm reaching the end. Um, so this talk has focused on a very few selected aspects of navigational culture in the formative period, looking at how material and social aspects could affect accumulation, transmission, and preservation of knowledge, mostly by characterizing broad mechanisms and institutions for this. It has necessarily been a flyby tour. I would like to close with a quote from Edwin Hutchins, author of a sociological study on modern navigational practice. Describing the behavior of the crew using their navigational instruments, he remarks, we can think of the team, oi, oi, I wanna move my thing so I can read it, sorry. We can think of the team, the crew, as a sort of flexible organic tissue that keeps the information moving across the tools of the task. When one part of this tissue is unable to move the required information, another part is recruited to do it. Surveying the range of approaches and diverse areas of interest and research tools in this workshop, I hope just such a multidisciplinary and collaborative ethos continues to prevail in our community as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shima, for this really interesting uh, talk. And I open the floor for uh, questions and comments, please. Gregory, you appeared. Please. Unmute. Uh, yeah. A very good uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, in, an obvious question in looking at all of these sea laws, mm -hmm. uh, did you find any mentions of charts? So later laws uh, in Catalonia from the 14th century do begin to stipulate the presence of charts on board, but I'm looking at a period before charts as such right. were necessarily commonplace or being applied broadly. So I did not detect any, any reference to that for the formative period. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to compliment uh, Greg's uh, question with uh, references to any other instruments, for instance, compass, compasses or... Uh... Dividers, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't see any, but I would have to look a lot closer. A lot of the laws are quite detailed on um, the expected condition of the ship. In or like what condition of a ship do you need to have in order to be indemnified if there's a disaster, whatever? That would be the area to look, but I'd have to look a bit more in depth to see if there's any reference. But mostly okay. it seems to be concerned not so much with the equipment of the ship, but with how it's loaded for safety purposes and um, how it's sealed and what state of condition the, the ship is in itself, at least for this period. So no references for uh, who to punish uh, due to bad navigation, no? Um, everything is about that. Honestly, the whole thing is about how, how do we, how do we give responsibility? Who has responsibility? Who has to be punished? Who has to suffer? Who has to sacrifice if things go wrong? You know, it's not about when things go right. It's about when things go wrong in these laws. So, so it, it specifically bit, about pilots, uh, well, the, did you find it? The problem, yeah, I didn't say this explicitly, but, uh, there's kind of a problem with trying to transpose the notion of a pilot lifted from the early modern period onto the formative period. The terminology is different and we have to very carefully infer what are the roles of the different people on the ship in these sources. But I don't think we can directly uh, transpose the early modern pilot onto a figure of the formative period. It's, yeah. it's a bit risky. I would say that uh, probably the, the the book book you know the the manuscript De Navigazione by Cotrulli is very explicit uh, in the in those roles mm -hmm. on board 
uh, even even if he's talking in 1450s, mm -hmm. but maybe it can help with the with the the right words for right. the 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 pro professional let's call it, on but board. i mean i'm not i have no pretensions to being an expert on this yeah. i'm just sharing yeah. like the impressions that i got because i was quite interested in these sources so and that's yeah that's why we 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 were i think we were really impressed and wanted to know more has wolfgang kebrer yeah. wants to I would muted. like, yeah, please unmute. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Just one simple observation. Uh, I don't know that well the Mediterranean uh, naval laws and, and collections of naval laws, but more the um, northern. Uh, the um, Les Cat Book de Wispy. Mm -hmm. And I have the impression that as far as decision making, mm -hmm. um, the collective, in the early books, the collective uh, uh, responsibility pertains not to navigational matters, but to matters of seamanship. Mm -hmm. And one has to clearly uh, distinguish between um, any material mm -hmm. that uh, is in the in the books and the laws that pertain to seamanship, for instance, who is can the crew uh, <clears throat> say, well, will not leave port under this uh, weather condition or not? But that's not a navigational decision; it's a decision of seamanship, and the mm -hmm. same same thing applies to to other uh, decisions concerning. Well, you, you, at one point you said direction. It's um, not direction in, the, in a navigational sense, but to which port will we uh, go to, which of course <clears throat> determines direction, but it, it's not a navigational decision, but a decision of uh, where, where, where do we want to go? Or where can we go under mm -hmm. these conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, that's an important um, distinction. Um, and that would explain why there is not such a, a lot of references to navigation equipments, pilots, and so on in these books. That's an excellent point. And I think something to be very, very careful to distinguish between. With that in mind, I will go back and look more closely and try to separate these things more clearly according to what is navigational versus what is seamanship. Thank you, that's really interesting. I see one hand uh, has been raised, but uh, if possible, a quick question by Andrew Blackler. What? Just a very quick comment. You mentioned pilots, um, and after 1204, uh, the Venetians were using the fortress of Modon in southern Greece as a pilot station, so boats would actually take on pilots before they entered the Aegean. So oh, that's we have another process that's by very which uh, the, this knowledge that you're talking about could get accumulated in the 13th century. I don't know whether that happened for the Genoese as well, right. uh, but, de but definitely for the uh, Venetians. That is so interesting. I was not aware of that. That's quite a helpful comment. Thank you. Okay, all right, cheers. Yes, and uh, just to finish this uh, session, thank you again, Shima. And that comment was very interesting uh, to point to something that uh, I think is is very very important. That is the the pilots that were specialists in uh, in their specific areas. So thank you for the comment. Thank you, Shima. And uh, if I'm allowed, I will take the if Enrique is here. I believe so. He is, of course. So uh, next, uh, we have uh, Enrique Leitão. Uh, he's also a member of, the, of our project and is currently uh, the PI, principal investigator of his own project, sponsored, let's say, sponsored by the ERC, that uh, is doing a remarkable job studying um, rudders. And uh, Enrique is going to talk 
about the nautical charts in the famous Junta of Elvas Badajoz in the 16th century. Enrique, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Let me just do this, you know, start the sharing of the screen. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, now, right? yeah. okay good. Yeah. So, you know, my, this communication is a part of a, of a larger project and the, the, the project is trying to trace the history of the discussions around the geometry of the nautical chart all throughout the 16th century and even into the 17th century. And this is an interesting topic because it is, according to me and to colleagues, uh, it, it was an important scientific problem, which has mostly eluded the, the attention of historians of science. So because, you know, perhaps because we, you know, as historians of cartography have not called the attention to this problem, it is not, you know, generally recorded in histories of, you know, science in, in Europe in the, in the 16th or 17th century. And yet it was a very important problem, as I will try to show. To make it very briefly, the question is the following, and this is the topic of my presentation. We know that nautical charts are complex objects in, term of, in terms of geometry. We know that they are even problematic. So, you know, nautical charts have problems, have errors, they have deformations. We know this, but the question is, when did historical people, so people in the past, realized this, when was the complexity of a nautical chart, uh, when did it emerge, when, when it was put in evidence, when was it uh, pointed by, you know, people in the past. So this is my topic here today. So I will not trace the whole history, although I will give some indications, but I'm, I'm, I'm especially interested at the moment when the complexity and in some sense the ambiguity of nautical charts became apparent. Now we do not have records of this during the uh, prior to the 15th century, actually not even in the, in the 15th century, only, only very very late. Uh, this is perhaps normal but we don't have them so we, re we really don't know. But the first records have to do, or the first indications, not even you know, a complete record, the first indications are related to uh, the negotiations around the Treaty of Tordesillas. So everybody knows about this, but let us look at the text of the treaty. So the treaty in its critical part says that, you know, what has to be made is a, a, the creation of a boundary or straight line to be determined and drawn north to north and south from pole to pole on the said ocean sea which is merely the Atlantic from the Arctic to the Antarctic pole and this boundary or line shall be drawn straight as aforesaid at a distance of 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands being calculated by degrees or by any other manner as may be considered the best and radius etc. So let me just make you know four comments on this. First, it is, you know, about a line, you know, from pole to pole in the, uh, in the Atlantic. It's just about the Atlantic. We, we can call this, you know, so it's a semi-meridian. Astronomical means <clears throat> are not mentioned, are not considered, especially longitude is never mentioned in, in, the, in the treaty, in the text of the treaty. As everybody knows, there is some ambiguity in these 370 leagues, you know, from which island, etc. This is This is well known. And finally, my, my final observation about this, we know that two technical commissions were created, one Spanish, one Portuguese, and they had to tackle this problem. And what was the problem? The problem was to draw this meridian. Now, one of the experts of the Spanish commission, the Castilian commission, Jaime Ferrer, in a report to Catholic Kings in 1495, explains that he had carefully considered the problem and I'm just summarizing what, what, what is a, a larger uh, report. And he explains that he compared nautical charts and Ptolemaic maps and concluded that the question was much harder than previously thought. 
in order to make progress, he said, one needed to be a, you know, a cosmographer, a mathematician, and a sailor. So obviously, the issue here is not on how to place a meridian at 370 leagues from, you know, from Cape Verde. This is not such a big problem. I mean, you can do with distance or whatever. The problem is, of course, on how to draw the meridian from pole to pole. Now, we know that, excuse me here, we know that in the Cantino planisphere, the meridian is drawn as this line. And what apparently, and this is my interpretation of the puzzlement that Ferrer shows, what apparently Ferrer noticed it was that this is much more hard to do than what one could have imagined. And today we know why this is much more hard. It is much more hard to do because of this, because the nautical chart has a, a complex inner geometry, this you know, term that Juicy and I use and clarifies the situation where we have all this type of other formation. And it, it, it's evident that the Cantino line is not a meridian and obviously not the meridian of, um, of Tordesillas. So this is one first indication, perhaps one of the very first that I know of, of problems being noted, you know, in the problems related with the inner geometry. So things are much harder than, than, you know, than previously thought. Another issue related with the complexity of um, nautical charts has to do with the deformations that are introduced in the cartography, so in the contour lines, due to the fact of magnetic variation not being taken correctly into account. So were they aware of this? And were, when, when were they aware of this? Now, interestingly, from you know, very quite early stages, they seem to be aware of this problem. John Lisboa in his you know, treatise on the Siemens compass, which is, as you know, as we all know, the, the first you know, uh, full treatise on, on, on the use of, 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 a, of a magnetic needle for navigational purposes, he, he explains the following. And so that this could be corrected, he's talking about cartography, it would be necessary to navigate by the truth, despite the fact that near the coast, while it is not corrected, the coast, you should only navigate by what is usual, because the false must be navigated falsely and the true truthfully. I don't have the time to go into detail on the interpretation of, of, of the, the, this excerpt, but it is clear that he is perfectly aware that there are two ways to navigate. One that he calls by the truth, that is following geographical uh, courses, so, you know, the, the true courses, so we would say corrected courses. And there is another way to navigate, which is the usual way, which is also a false way in a sense, and that is following the magnetic courses. So they are perfectly aware of the distinction, but more than that, they are aware that cartography is changed, is affected by this fact. He knows that near the, co the coast, it is necessary to follow magnetic courses because near the coast, in, it is where, when, where you know, cartography was made following magnetic courses and there has to be consistency between the cartography, so the charts and um, the, the, the way to navigate. So this was somehow clear at the very beginning. So it's another indication that the complexity of, um, of nautical uh, charts was becoming apparent at the beginning of the 16th century. Now, we, we, we all know it very briefly, so the effect, this is, this is very important. So if we do not correct the magnetic courses, so if we follow them, if we follow the magnetic courses, not the geographical ones, when, when navigation is made by, so dead reckoning, so estimation and you know, distance and, and course, this is the left part, this will create some, some rotation and depends on the, the magnetic declination, but the effect will be a slight rotation. Whereas if one uses uh, latitude and course, this 
the, the, the fact that we are not correcting courses will give rise to a, an horizontal displacement, so a longitudinal displacement, okay? This, this we know today, okay? Now, all of these first indications that, you know, nautical charts are more complex or they have, you know, features, inner geometrical features. And here I would like to underline that the mere uh, description that nautical charts have errors is much too vague, I mean, because, you know, errors can be just due to clumsiness, but this is not the issue here. The issue is that there is some intrinsic properties which are more complex than, than what one uh, thought previously, and they are figuring out. All of these issues will, you know, become critical with the with the Malukas issue. We will. So the, very briefly. So in 1500, you know, and 11. Actually, in 1509, the Portuguese reach Malacca, and in 1511, they do conquer Malacca. And you know, afterwards in 1512, immediately they reach the Moluccas. Hmm. Now, from those years, there is recorded indications, both in Spain, there is, you know, ever since the conquest of Malacca by the Portuguese, there are complaints in Spain that that region is already on the Spanish side of the Tordesillas treaties. If the Tordesillas meridian had been, you know, completed to the other side of the earth. There are complaints, but not only from the Spanish, even some Portuguese do believe that some of them, even Malacca, but most of them even believe that the Moluccas are already on the Spanish side, on the Castilian side of the demarcation line. And this creates an enormous uh, commotion and a uh, big discussion on, 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 on where are truly the Moluccas. Now, of course, we all know this. So the, the issue is, you know, the continuation of the Tordesillas Treaty and where, what, what is the relative position of the Moluccas in relation to this. Now, this fact, that is the fact that the location of some islands now acquired imperial significance, raised enormous discussion and echoed a little bit, not only in, not a little bit, but echoed not only in Iberia, but also outside of Iberia. And it, in relation to it, it generated immediately enormous uh, discussion about longitude. And we have many indications. Some of those might be co mere coincidences, but it's even, even so, it is striking that around the 10s and 20s, you know, the two first decades of the 16th century, so much effort started to be put on the determination of longitude when the problem of longitude by astronomical means had been mostly dormant throughout the Middle Ages, but now it became it became critical. And these are some of the indications. And you know, more more could be could, could be given. And I will go rapidly because I'm running out of time. So suddenly, the problem of longitude gains a, a new uh, relevance. And of course, this is what is behind you know Magellan's expedition, you know, trying to reach the Moluccas, but making sure that the Moluccas are on the Spanish side. And you know, Magellan being convinced uh, that the Moluccas are truly on the Castilian side. Uh, and this is what makes the, the, the voyage. Now, the return of the Magellan expedition, when, you know, when the Victoria returns with the famous 18 survivors, creates an enormous discussion between uh, uh, Portugal and Castile. Because when Elcano returns, immediately the Portuguese king complains to Charles V, saying that you know, the Spaniards had been in the Moluccas and they had traded there and that was a Portuguese region by the Treaty of Tordesillas. And there is, you know, some diplomatic um, discussion around this and it was decided that in order to clarify this, some diplomatic meetings, juntas, this is the, the name, who should be held. I'm summarizing because it's a little bit more complex, but I will go rapidly here. So on February 1524, the two crowns agree on having conversations to decide about the property and the possession of the Moluccas. Now, interestingly, it is explicitly said that both parties, Portugal and Castile, 
should bring teams of astrologers, that means astronomers, cosmographers, pilots, sailors, as well as, you know, literati, so scholars, that means uh, law people. In fact, just to give you an idea, the Portuguese team that goes to those diplomatic meetings is two thirds uh, of tech is made two thirds of technical personnel and only one third are uh, law people. So you, you have three jurists, diplomats, and then there are three mathematicians and cosmographers, and then there are three pilots. So obviously, evidently, the technical and scientific and cosmographical geographical issue was critical here. But now that things become very interesting because uh, so, you know, uh, because the instructions, I'm sorry, the instructions of the Portuguese king start to reveal what is going on in the discussions. And not only, so the king says that, you know, the location of the Malukas has to be clarified by astrologers, so scientists and sailors, but the king also says the following, the astrologers that are sent to take care of this problem of property are instructed that in no way they should accept that the demarcation is made if not by eclipses of the moon, if not by longitude measurements. And although nautical charts and globes can be used during the discussions, the king says this way that is longitude measurements is the true and final one. So for the Portuguese team, measurements of longitude has to be made and nautical charts are not to be trusted. Now nautical charts would at this point would place the Malukas on the Spanish side and so clearly here it is very obvious that for the Portuguese authorities there is a deep problem with nautical charts. Nautical charts are introdu introducing so deformations in longitude which in this case work against Portuguese interests. So the king says it has to be only by longitude measurements. We do not trust those nautical charts. Now note the nautical charts that had made possible for you know, Portuguese and Spanish vessels to reach the Malucas. Now they are not trusted if we want to make a diplomatic discussion. So what is going on? The first session starts on April and a total of 14 sessions, I, I will just comment the first one. And the Portuguese party demands that the position of the Malukas be determined astronomically by, with eclipses, by the longitude. Now, there is a discussion about this. In, indeed, there is an interesting point, which is Ferdinand Columbus mentions that in order to measure longitude, one could use a timekeeping device. This is in the session of 13 April. This is the first recorded uh, mention of this, of using uh, timekeeping devices to determine longitude. But finally, the Castilian side does not agree with longitude measurements and says only charts must be used. So the determination of the position of Omelucas has to rely solely on the nautical charts. And indeed, they do even accuse the Portuguese of insisting in law on longitude measurements just to delay matters. Now, Interestingly, at more or less the same time, a long report had been sent to the Portuguese king, warning the king that the demarcation of the Malucas should never be made using nautical charts. In the Portuguese phrasing is in nenhuma maneira se pode nem deve de marcar pelas cartas, which is very radical, okay? Now, this report is very interesting because the author of the report, the Duke of Braganza, so it's a house of Braganza, some technicians around the house of Braganza, lists carefully and in detail all the problems that the nautical charts have. And this is, as far as I know, the first attempt, the first document ever at trying to list the problems that nautical charts have. And the author identifies a number of problems one, because you know, there is a difference between spherical and the plane, so the problem with the planification. A second problem, because you know, pilots and cartographers, sometimes you know, they're, 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 there is some carelessness there. There are you know, errors in general. 
Third, because sometimes the distance to India was deliberately exaggerated by pilots so that they could you know, claim longer voyages, these type of things. Fourthly, because there, is, there are errors in longitude and in the fifth position, because you know, the position of the marine and the tortoises is not you know, still very clear. There is this problem now. Now, this is very interesting because as far as I said, as far as I know, it's the first attempt at, at really engaging with the complexity of nautical charts. And the, 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 the reason for this was the negotiation, the very political negotiation about the position of the Moluccas. Okay. Now there is even there are even more interesting aspects which I do not have time to comment, but one I must you know, necessarily comment is because he makes a very prescient remark by noting that trying to correct, correct longitudes in nautical charts could lead to even greater errors. Querendo agora emendar as longitudes, porventura se fariam tão erradas ou mais do que agora são. That is, there is no simple way of from a nautical chart correcting the longitude and then making it correct. If you do this, you will run into deeper problems. So here the full complexity of the object becomes apparent. Now, now this, uh, because of this, an enormous discussion raised in, you know, started in Portugal with many discussions and with two, two social groups essentially, because you know, mathematicians and cartographers started to realize the complexity of the nautical chart, whereas pilots insisted on their on it the, the usefulness i mean nautical charts were useful and for example there are records of pilots that write to the portuguese kings king saying that in, in you know in, in relation to this question of the Moluccas, you know the the nautical charts are the only thing that that one has and that one should lead this big discussion uh, led to an enormous skepticism on nautical charts to the point that you know that Portugal's leading mathematician had had to enter the fray, and he did so by writing a treatise in defense of the nautical chart. And it is very important that in '37 it was required of a top mathematician to write a book in defense of the nautical chart. Such was the critique on the problems of nautical chart that was going on already in Portugal. Sorry, Enrique, in defense of our time, uh, I would... Uh, One minute be, more. Uh, yeah, thank you. One thank minute. you very much. So in this, in this text, he explains many, not all, of the problems of nautical charts. So cartographic representations depend on the set of sea routes used. Meridians are not straight lines. Uh, uh, they are curved lines and you know they converge they are only useful for navigates you should not uh, think of nautical charts as representations of the world but yet and this is the final conclusion despite this problem they are the most adequate instrument to navigate i, I stop here i have a, a number of other things to comment but i will just want to emphasize two or three things so the discussion a true uh, documented discussion on the geometry of the nautical chart can be traced to the 20s and it is around the Moluccas problem and it has its climatic moment during the negotiations of the Juntas the, uh, uh, of uh, Badajoz. From there, the response of this mathematician will lead to an enormous discussion that will go throughout the 16th century. And to end, I will just show what I did not have time to show, but makes it two major books at the end of the 16th century, one immensely influential in England, so Edward Wright's book, another immensely influential in uh, Iberia, Cespedes book, which still tackle with the problems of the nautical chart that had been clarified, that had, been, that had emerged at the beginning of the 16th century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Let me, me just go just, back. Just Please like, uh, stop. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm really happy that you stopped at that point because otherwise I would have to make a new presentation for tomorrow. So thank you, Enrique, <laughs> because it's very interesting, of course, to me. And uh, we already have uh, Wolfgang Köberer 
please uh, unmute and go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Eric. Um, just a couple of um, remarks. The uh, discussion between the, the proponents of charts and of astronomical methods uh, was a discussion that was also in the Casa de Contratación in Spain. Um, that's the, the, the thing that um, Ursula Lamb wrote about. But, and but, but that's much later, that's in the 40s and 50s. Yes, but it's the same problem. Oh, yes, but this is in the 20s. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it, it, it uh, shows the same um, uh, war lines, front lines between the two, the two methods. <laughs> Um, by the way, um, the uh, Spanish uh, delegation had a mariner who actually circumnavigated the uh, with Magellan, Francisco yes. Albo, yes. Uh, and he's probably the only uh, mariner on that commission who really knew what he was talking about. Now, uh, the the last comment is the Portuguese king, of course, was absolutely right because longitude measurement at the time was only possible by uh, uh, lunar eclipses. And that was a method well known for, for centuries. And therefore it's a kind of strange that he finally caved in and, and um, went over to the side of the chart proponents. Well, I, I, I agree 100% with you. I mean, the, 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 of course, you mentioned the, the, the very famous discussion at the Casa Contratación, the forces. I, I finished my, my story in the 30, in 37, year 37. There is an enormous story afterwards, not only in the Casa de Contratación, which has been studied by Ursula Lam, but in many other places. And this is precisely the point we are trying to stress here. There was an enormous scientific problem being debated and it had to do with the geometry of the nautical chart. And, yeah. in, you know, in, in, in more abstract terms, in the problems that arise when one wants to try to coordinate geographical maps made with Ptolemaic prescription with nautical charts made with nautical techniques. And whenever one tries to coordinate these two, one immediately runs into enormous problems. And they started noticing, and my, my point here, when again, you're absolutely right, is that we can somehow pinpoint the beginning of this at the discussions in the, in the 1520s. Another question from Joaquin, go ahead, please. Yes, just a short comment. Just a short. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, you tried to, you tried to say a lot of things in so short a time. So I, I just wanted to say two more details, which you didn't talk about. One is that the longitude was actually measured during the version, the, the, the voyage of Magellan by Andres de San Martin, who was a who was a. a a cosmographer, an astronomer, and correctly determined the longitude uh, at the Moluccas. Uh, unfortunately, he was perhaps silenced when uh, his data, because he died there when when Victoria uh, returned, returned to Lisbon. So we quite understand why the Spanish didn't want to use uh, longitudes. And the other question is that uh, the first date when they fully understood or they understood partially why charts were so, so wrong apparently uh, was with uh, João de Castro who made measurements uh, of magnetic declination and uh, correlated the longitudinal the displacements with magnetic declination. Thank you. But that was also in the 40s. It's not a 40s, it's in 38. 38. <laughs> And it's in my last slide, which I did not have the time to show. I, I know, I know. <laughs> Critically important here, of course, but it's the, the continuation of the story, yeah. So one last quick question. Luis Robles, please. Your video is off. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm in the middle of somewhere. Um, I had a, a comment because in the, there is a book published in 1519 by Martin Fernandez de Enciso, 
that has, I mean, it's uh, about uh, the Summa de Geografia, so it's about world geography. And there is a section where it discusses world maps. And I, in my opinion, that that section has not really been well understood. And now, thanks to this kind of approach, like what you presented, Enrique, I think we can now grasp better that he was actually working with several possible options to to produce the world map that he wanted to sell along with his book. And he weighs the pros and cons. Um, I'm writing a paper on that, and I hope to publish it, uh, I mean, to, to present it next November in a, at the conference in Seville. So I think it, it's complementary because it's not really about declination. It's the issue of Ptolemaic world maps versus nautical planispheres. Mm -hmm. What are the, the advantages and drawbacks? And to me, that's already a discussion of this, of this topic right before the time that you, that you mentioned, the 15th of I I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't know the details. You know more than, than I do, but, but I think you should be right. And there is like a, an underlying theme in the, my presentation, which is the following, you know, Historians of science know that you know, you know, external conditions, like in this case, imperial conditions, political conditions, do provide you know gravitas to scientific problems. So uh, until there was big discussions that involve longitude and the geometry of the nautical chart, you don't have. But after 1512, then you have the conditions where the problem becomes acute and of political relevance, and then it spreads all over. Yes, thank you all. Uh, I'm really happy and uh, the, the juntas uh, have been um, really puzzling to me uh, many years now, and I'm really happy that, uh, that Enrique and his, his team are uh, studying in detail um, this documentation, I will, I, I would really, um, I couldn't be uh, more emphatic to everybody saying that please be aware of uh, the, the studies that are coming out from that uh, analysis because I, I really, I really know that uh, it will be very important and meaningful. So, uh, thank you again. Uh, and next, we have Anton Gordiev. I believe, Dr. Gordiev, so also uh, an expert in geography and uh, to whom I'm really in debt because um, he wrote some years ago in 2015, a very interesting and large paper about place names uh, in the Black Sea and Sea of Azov that uh, is really important and that I, I've, it, it has helped me a lot in my own work. So the, the floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Okay. The most important indicator of uh, comparative analysis, both subjective and objective, is the identity of the comparison elements. It is identical uh, and similar elements that uh, researchers are looking for when examining uh, a map or any other artifact. On an in intuitive basis, uh, when evolution any artifact, this algorithm is used uh, by age researcher to best of erudition and uh, data for comparison. Based uh, on the elements identity, hypothesis about the original origin uh, accepted. The more identical uh, elements, the, the, the more confident uh, the prediction. The identity of the elements underlies uh, the hypothesis uh, discussed in this work. We accept uh, as a condition uh, that all place names uh, in the maps uh, took from a kind of prototype, right and graphic, and uh, over time they gradually changes uh, relative uh, to the prototype. Based on this, we can uh, be suggested uh, that the number of changes uh, in the maps following the prototype uh, gradually accumulated over time. From accepted uh, conditions, 
of the hypothesis. It follows uh, that cartography or cartographic organization, school, workshop, uh, starting its uh, activity, uses in an initial list of cartographic uh, of place names for mapping. The list can be bought, uh, borrowed, uh, created by the founder based on uh, his own experience or inherit it. As uh, the following maps, the initial list uh, is refined and edited due to various causes. It happens gradually and evolution way. Identity can uh, be uh, quantified by comparative statistical analysis. Statistics uh, is one of the form, forms of practical activity of people. The purpose on, uh, of which is the collection, processing and analysis of mass, uh, mass uh, data on certain uh, phenomena. The map uh, elements are subject uh, to objective analysis uh, provide uh, the uh, su uh, sufficient statistics, text elements, place names, legends, inscription, and more, graphic elements, form and localization, water areas, uh, rivers, scapes, islands, rocks, scale, compass and wine roses, uh, drawing design elements, uh, handwriting, its basic elements, map or atlas composition, map uh, sheet form, layout, projection, volume of map elements, it's the list of these uh, items can be refined and expanded. For the possi uh, possibility uh, of statistical comparison, a database of place names for the Black Sea region was created from uh, 420 Portland charts. Uh, date of creation and the uh, place of uh, creation are indicated only by legend. It turned uh, out that uh, in the base of place names, about 50% uh, of uh, the signet maps and 50 are not signet. That is, uh, they do not have the date, author, and place uh, of creation. For analysis, uh, all place uh, names uh, when comparing one map with a uh, of the others were divided into three groups. Identical, different, and uh, cannot be compared. Identical are place names uh, that are spelled identically on the maps under study. All other place names are different. Uh, to not compare it refers uh, to place names uh, that have no analogs on uh, one of the compared maps. The different place names uh, can be divided into similar ones, which uh, differ slightly uh, from similar place names uh, uh, on another map. Uh, the reason may be cartographers' errors, uh, clarification, replacement of letters with uh, similar sounding ones. It's and differs signif uh, significantly. The not comparable uh, place names are important in historical analysis. They can indicate new information. The need to research uh, the results due to which they appeared uh, on maps or disappeared. But they uh, can be included uh, from the comparative analysis science, no analogs to compare. Therefore, only three elements groups in uh, a comparative analysis are in the word. Identical, similar, and uh, very different can be compared each. The identical, similar, and strongly different place names can be taken as uh, 100% or one for coefficient the total amount. Then it remains for us to find of the sum uh, of edge of these groups of compared place names on the compared maps. Ooh, this is uh, from uh, program, uh, the image. The identical place names from the Portland charts uh, of the Black Sea region are the main subject of this study. Each uh, mapmaker has a certain initial set of elements uh, 
<coughs> to make a particular chart. In the process uh, of making the following maps, information about changes, uh, some elements coming. Uh, deviation uh, from the prototype is begin, uh, beginning. These changes uh, accumulate over time in uh, quantitative terms. Based on the uh, hypothesis, the highest is uh, in terms of quantity, the identity, uh, identity coefficient will be indicated uh, prototypes of the following charts. The main indicator is the place names uh, identical in writing. When comparing the, the two studied maps uh, on the basis of these place names, it is possible to determine the coefficient of their application. It can be called uh, the identity coefficient. For calculated identity coefficient was applied the overlap coefficient. For research, select the uh, chart of the Black Sea from the Atlas of Portland charts by Petrus Visconti, Thetan uh, Thetan. This is Atlas Sigma, this is Famous Atlas. Compare these uh, all charts from the database. We get comparison graph uh, where you can see that the highest coefficient about uh, 0 0.6. It is the very beginning of the, uh, of the graph, uh, somewhere up to uh, 30, uh, 30, uh, 30. We increase this segment of the graph and get uh, the direct picture and comparison de data in the table for the next uh, 20 charts. This 20 charts. Uh, this is table with uh, coefficient in data tool. <coughs> for convenience, uh, we rank in ascending order. We will see the, the uh, chart can uh, be attributed by Petrus Vesconte. This is uh, coefficient identity. Uh, Petrus Vesconte, Venice, and uh, from uh, the period uh, of creation 1311 uh, to uh, 1327. And most probably in the, in from, it's from Venice. And pre uh, I present another example, chart uh, after uh, uh, place of creation unknown, <coughs> 50th uh, century attribute. Compared with all charts from the database, we get a comparison graph where it can be seen that the half heads coefficient about 0, 0.5, 0, 0.6 is uh, somewhere from uh, 13, uh, 30 to 1375 of this period. This is uh, unknown uh, after. The comparison result, uh, results are in the table. According to, we can conclude the Portland charts was made on Mallorca during the period uh, 1320, 1339, uh, just by those that Angerina is closest. This is table. For verifying authorship of charts, which uh, identity coefficient of charts by those Angelina we need uh, to know. Comparing charts uh, uh, by Dyson and Gilina with all other from that database uh, to do this. This comparing result uh, map number 13, uh, 15, uh, you see Dyson and Gilina, this is uh, 07, 08, and uh, map uh, number uh, 15. Based on Angelina uh, and uh, uh, identity with coefficient uh, 0, 08 and 0, 07. <clears throat> we see that uh, it is indicative in uh, the limits uh, 0, 076, 0, uh, 0, 081. 
of this, we conclude that uh, the chart number 112, which uh, coefficient identity uh, 0, 0,5, not belong, uh, does not belong to this after. For a more detailed analysis, uh, let us compare the identical place names on chart number 112 with chart number 18, uh, 13, uh, 14, and 15. Uh, <coughs> uh, place names uh, modern city Jide, uh, Turkey, is indicated uh, on uh, maps. No, uh, number 112. <clears throat> but Kutule uh, as place names, uh, uh, name uh, Castello indicated the same place. In any chart, these names are not marked together. By chart number uh, 112, the place names of the modern city uh, uh, Jude, Turkey, is indicated as Kulturi. This is only charts by Petrus Visconti of these place names indicated as Kulturi, Kulturi. Uh, this is in tab uh, table. Kulturi. Kutule, Kutule, and the uh, unknown maps. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, by Bartos uh, Angelino and uh, later are uh, other authors as Castella. This Castella. Conclusions for this map. The chart number 112 uh, made in Mallorca. This uh, chart can be dated uh, 1320, 13, uh, 39, or by charts used uh, as source material, including maps produced uh, in the same period in uh, Venice. It makes uh, sense to explore the origin of the place name of the modern city uh, Jude, namely uh, during the change of place names Kitori, Kitori, Castella, which is uh, in tune with the ASEAN Roman port of Kitoris, located in the area. Based on research by the proposed methodology for edge portal on chart, a prediction was made about the place, time of creation, and uh, the after of uh, the portal on charts. This table is published in my uh, book. This is a map for analysis, uh, the best uh, result uh, for coefficient identity uh, and prediction uh, for each map. And verification, uh, but uh, legend only. The date and uh, place of creation for all the maps studied or this work are provided. Charts with the legend uh, of date and uh, place creation were used uh, for uh, validated to confirm the hypothesis about the identity coefficient. From 161 charts with the legend, uh, 11 charts do not uh, justify the prediction, and only after 16th century, which is about 7%. Uh, percent, uh, percent. This is uh, the prediction by authorship place and period of creation is uh, made on the basis of analysis of the Black Sea region charts only. This study should be extended to all regions of the normal part of uh, For maps in which the comparison identity coefficient above uh, 0, 07 is likely to confirm authorship map. The conclusion is empirical. Make a production, uh, prediction uh, for charts with an identity coefficient less than 0 of 2 is not possible. It may be including a fake uh, or not enough uh, data on these authors. Make sense uh, in future work uh, by a coefficient of identity 
uh, to test uh, some hypotheses that uh, are visible when uh, comparing charts. For example, the similarity of maps prototypes. The relationship, uh, rela relationship uh, between master and student uh, charts by identity coefficient uh, it is easy enough to determine and other. This is only a small part of uh, what uh, st uh, statistical analysis can give. The book and my other articles about Portland charts uh, can be found uh, on uh, the internet. Thank, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And I would like to open the floor for questions. We have a question from Shima. Please go ahead. Please unmute yourself, please. No, I didn't make a question. I made a no clapping. Comment. Congratulations. Oh, clapping. Very interesting. Sorry. OK, so after clapping, anyone would like to comment? This is a book. <laughs> This book. Yes, Joaquin first and then Tony in my screen at least. Go ahead, Joaquin, please. Okay, Anton, thank you very much for your presentation. I had to leave for a couple of minutes, so maybe the question I will make to you is stupid because maybe maybe I I, I was not present when you talked about it. There is and how should I say an acid test a way of validating your your statistical analysis uh, and say uh, and predict the, the authorship of a chart, which is to take a couple of charts whose authors are known and make the statistical analysis to them and see if their predictions are correct uh, or not. Are you following me? Uh, I say uh, I'm a very uh, on uh, maps uh, uh, with legends. I'm prediction uh, for maps uh, with legends, uh, 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 date and uh, after and the uh, place of creation. Uh, I'm verification for this chart it is uh, about 50% this chart. Okay, so, so you are not taking uh, uh, anonymous charts and try to determine the, the authorship of them. My English, uh, I'm uh, not practic uh, for English. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I, give, I give the word to, uh, to Tony. If you uh, have um, uh, demonstrate uh, this is program, I have a program uh, for uh, this work. Okay, thank you very much, Anton. Okay. Please, Tony, you may give to Tony, Tony, please. Uh, okay, go ahead, please, Tony. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to thank you very much indeed, Anton, for not just for this paper, but for all the work you've done over the years. Um, I mean, you know, when you think about the Black Sea and Portland charts, then there's nowhere else to go but to your. A, a, a very, very um, complete and careful um, documentation. Um, I just wondered whether or not you could tell us about any um, attributions, um, uh, any authorship um, suggestions that your data has thrown up that are, which are let perhaps, um, uh, you know, of, of great significance. Um, I could mention, for example, that the uh, Luxoro Atlas, a small atlas, was from at one stage was was um, I think possibly because of the the person who owned it at the time uh, was uh, considered to be the, the oldest uh, chart uh, surviving, and uh, it, it was then possible to show that it was actually uh, drawn by um, the Chesanis, who uh, signed a chart in 1421. So. Have you been able to, um, as it were, make a, any, any really interesting and unexpected 
discoveries with your, your method? Uh, Tony, uh, maybe uh, do not uh, on the air. I can help to translate if you wish. Вопрос, могли вы с вашим методом сделать какие-то неожиданные открытия, например, в авторстве, что касается карт, где нет автора? Можете ли вы установить автора вашим методом? I am demonstrating this. Anton said that he, he tried to show this as, as far as I could see. Yes, that he could, uh, he could uh, uh, the method can establish the author sometimes. Okay, uh, now... Uh, uh, I'm demonstrating... Uh, this is uh, my program. Uh, um, Shima, are you? Can you hear me? Uh, no. Uh, um, uh, uh, said, uh, I can hear you. Was someone asking if they can? But, but uh, this yes. is. Uh, I was. I was asking for maybe. Uh, Shima, sorry. Yes, here. <laughs> I was just, uh, just just asking if he could give us an example of of a, a dramatic discovery, if, if this is the case, that he has made about the authorship. Okay, Anton, вы можете сделать какой-то пример очень какого-то неожиданного открытия в авторстве, который принес ваш метод? Какой-то пример? In the uh, people or no, uh, in Mac, uh, 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 they discovered uh, a map uh, from uh, uh, covered for uh, Notarium Act. Uh, this map, uh, not uh, uh, after not. Uh, after this is uh, only a uh, big, uh, no, uh, small part uh, of map. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, this is uh, map have, uh, has uh, Black Sea. Uh, Can you show the map maybe? It will be easier to, to follow. In the Russian language, there was a card Она была обложкой для материальных актов. Сохранилась часть, где было черное море. Вы можете показать, потому что мы говорим по-русски, покажите карту, потому что они просят какой-то пример, где вы установили, например, авторство или принадлежность какое-то неожиданное открытие. I'm trying to, to ask to show us an example. Здесь надо искать. Я сейчас не готов. <laughs> so he would have to look for it, yes. but he could give an example, maybe maybe after the talk yes. uh, or tomorrow to send a link. Well, that okay. would, that, I'm sure that would be of general interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, there is no, something. Uh, I... This is uh, many, uh, uh, many times for this. Uh, this is my database uh, for charts. <sighs> okay. Uh, um, I am demonstrate uh, this. Yes. Now, I'm uh, uh, for this uh, map, uh, this map, uh, unknown, uh, for comparative, 
This is map, uh, maybe Rosselli uh, Prunus, uh, Petrus. Uh, but uh, uh, 70, uh, the, uh, 0, 06, 0, uh, no, 0, 0, 06 percent. This is uh, period and uh, Rosselli Petrus. Maybe this map. You see, uh, this is uh, uh, about uh, 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 fifteen eighty five. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and the uh, other uh, chart from uh, the base. Very interesting. I think that we can continue a uh, discussion maybe with Anton in a, after this session. I would, I would ask uh, Anton to stop sharing screen, maybe, oh, uh, or at least, well, if you're going to show, okay. This is uh, this two Rosselli Petrus. <laughs> okay. And, uh, this is comparing comparing charts, right? And uh, place names on charts and uh, inspecting the the coefficients, right, Anton? Yes, and uh, this is analysis. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the uh, toponyms. Uh, yes, I I I do find it very interesting. And uh, I think this is an excellent tool that could be extended and should be extended to all the Mediterranean. Uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, um, per se, it's not sufficient to, this is my opinion, to establish authorship. And uh, there are other things, um, graphical, graphical analysis and uh, that we can and should perform to establish authorship because uh, well I'm thinking out loud for instance uh, if we take charts with different dimensions even from the same author uh, a smaller chart will have less names and less toponyms and uh, it will be at the same made by the same author for instance so yes, this is, in my opinion, very, very interesting, very interesting. I hope that you continue uh, with this work and uh, I'll, I'll be looking forward. And uh, I don't know if you want to comment anything else, but if not, Wolfgang the discussion- has a question. Oh, yes, Wolfgang Köberer. Please make it, make well, it that's quick, that's please. Not it's not exactly a question, it's a, a comment. Just, uh, just a comment. I think um, this is following something that Tony has been doing for years now, and that, in my opinion, is one of the, the most fruitful um, projects in um, discussing portal and charts. Um, Tony hasn't done anything statistical and uh, from other discussions you might know, Tony and Joachim, you know that I am very wary of uh, mathematical uh, discussions in, uh, about portal and charts. But this one, this, this way of um, well, looking at toponyms, uh, I think will lead somewhere. And I, I hope that um, Antony will uh, come up with um, some uh, astonishing correlations that could um, answer 
uh, Tony's question of uh, if, whether there are any discoveries made in this way. This, uh, yes. Just, mm -hmm. Maybe Joaquin would like to, to comment. Yes, yes, just a short suggestion. I agree with Wolfgang. This is a promising way of analyzing charts using statistical methods for the top teams. But of course, you have to you have to publish this in English because otherwise your work will not be known. Uh, we will not know your work because unfortunately we can't we can't read uh, Russian. Uh, you need the community to be informed about what's going on, and I do believe this could be a very powerful uh, tool. But you could make it about available to the scrutiny of of your colleagues of your peers. Okay. I agree, and I, I hope Anton can uh, can provide us uh, more information in, in English, please. And uh, I think I think he will. I see in his face that he's <laughs> he's going to do that. <laughs> thank you very much. I think that we can uh, we can thank the three three people involved in this session. It was a pleasure and an honor to me to listen to your uh, papers. 